Okay, so today I'm going to walk you through how to install the uh, RubbleFlow Docker container on your Raspberry Pi device so that you can deploy a RubbleFlow train model, a custom YOLO V8 train model, or a custom YOLO V5 train model onto your Raspberry Pi device and run inference just with the CPU. So this is going to run on device again. And I'm just gonna show you here how to initialize the Docker container. And then you'll see uh, the CPU usage here. It probably seems a little high, but remember, I also have a screen recorder uh, running on my device. So it's making that CPU usage look a little higher. Otherwise, on this Raspberry Pi 4 Model B, um, this is, yeah, running without issue. So, all right. You'll see here how the server is now available to receive the traffic. So this means that we can now start uh, running inference or making inference calls. And I'll just highlight some of that example code here for you. Uh, so this example code is just showing you um, quickly how the folder and the code is set up to get your private API key, workspace ID, model ID, and version number in here correctly so that you can run inference seamlessly, um, even without having this example, as this is extensible to other edge device deployment options that we have available. All right, so that URL is found in multiple places. Um, so the information you're gonna wanna extract from the project URL to uh, get everything running for inference, it's available from a universe URL, your own project URL, and also within the API docs on RoboFlow Universe, that section. So you're always gonna need your private API key, model ID, version number, or uh, you can add your workspace ID as well, just to get a little more selective there, but that'll help you run things programmatically through RubbleFlow, such as, you know, the signing images, uh, uploading images, running inference uh, with your models, and training models and generating versions. Even. You're going to need your private API key, too. So the thing with that private API key is if you do ever expose it, remember that you can actually get rid of it. Uh, well, at least the current one you have, you can revoke it and generate a new one. So that way you can um, get past uh, some of those security issues. But that doesn't mean to, you know, recklessly <laughs> let your private API key out there. Remember, you're going to want to try to keep that thing as safe as possible. So first, we're going to set up this code to run inference on a single image. So take a look at the confidence and overlap parameters. But overlap parameters just saying, okay, if these bounding boxes of the same class overlap more than this percentage, consider them the same detection confidence. If a confidence is above this percentage, show it. So here we're gonna now open the terminal. We're going to create a virtual environment, activate it, and then actually install uh, the RoboFlow Python package within it. So uh, I'm just also with VS Code here going to make this virtual environment the default virtual environment uh, for this workspace or folder. That way, every time I open it, this is the virtual environment that's activated. So then I know all my dependencies are, are there and available. Um, okay, so also with those virtual environments, um, if you're using Conda and you just want to make a Conda environment for this, that's fine too. Just either way, install that RoboFlow Python package to follow along with the example I'm showing here. And now we'll go ahead and run inference on a single image file on our Raspberry Pi. And as you're seeing here, uh, it takes a little bit longer for the first inference call uh, to run through the server. And that's just because with that first call, we're really downloading the weights from that model version and we're caching them on the device. And from here, all of our subsequent calls will be much, much faster. And when it comes up here, uh, you'll see our uh, JSON response object and then how that's attached uh, or how that works. Uh, you get the X and Y locations, the width and the height of the bounding box predictions, the image width and height that you predicted on, the class, the confidence score as well for, for each class that was detected. Remember, we did specify the confidence we wanted uh, results to appear at. And then we can also change and update the codes so that we can save our predictions uh, to image files 
uh, or specific locations or folders, and then also plot the results. And then uh, when you actually close the box here, um, the um, code actually fully exits because it's running through the OpenCV library. So it's like the destroy all windows uh, command there or the de destroy all windows method. So next we're going to highlight our result image. Um, well, I'm going to highlight it for you and the results that came up. So you'll see that uh, classes uh, did appear here in, a, in inferences were made. So mask and no mask were actually classes within this, but you'll see those didn't appear here. And some good reasons why are that, well, we're, the person's face isn't really pointing to us, so we can't really tell. And uh, that's how the data set was labeled. So if uh, they're not facing me and I don't know for sure, I don't wanna just assume they're not wearing the mask. And then, but person was another class in here and that's not coming up. So that's problematic because we did wanna also detect people on the construction site. Um, and so we're gonna to wanna to use active learning to improve those results. So some ways that we can do that is uh, taking a sample footage uh, that we've taken uh, on our site where we have issues, where we aren't receiving detections or we should be receiving detections or receiving false detections in certain cases. We we'll wanna pipe those images back to our actual model uh, or back to our projects so that we can relabel those and retrain and redeploy. So that's that active learning process so that we can run smart sampling essentially to quickly improve our inference results. And next here, we're going to uh, run predictions uh, for show you on uh, multiple uh, image files or on a single folder of image files. So you can do things again, like changing your confidence score. And uh, that confidence score is just gonna say, hey, at this confidence or above, I want you to show inference results overlap saying if image or if uh, bounding boxes of the same class overlap by this percentage or higher, I want you to consider those as the same object. It's just quick um, uh, edit here, we're missing a parentheses in the code. So the, if you just copy and paste this from the documentation now, this is actually now updated. Okay, so uh, our actual result image. Um, so we're deleting that because if we run it with this result image in here, because the code is currently written to run on that current directory, every image file in there, including that result image, would have had inference run on it. And it already has bounding boxes on it, so there's no point. Um, and that's just an extra inference call for no reason. Um, so you can, um, yeah, now run inference on every image within here. And you can highlight or change the save path that you would like those inference images to go to or the uh, directory that you want to run uh, this on. Or you can uh, even manipulate uh, what the saved files names would be if you, you know, wanted to just keep everything within the same place or whatever your preferences are on how you run this. Just highlighting how this code looks for you so that it's quick and easy for you to make the necessary changes if you just wanted to run the examples. All right, now that we've picked our save location and inference image result names, let's uh, go ahead and run inference here on these multiple image files, save them to the uh, images to infer directory or just save them to the current directory in this case here. All right, so we'll do that Python three and then infer underscore multiple dot pi to run inference with this current code here in this file. All right, loading workspace and project, and then hitting that model endpoint. All right, and there you go. You see our JSON response object format that we logged to, well, not logged to console, but um, printed to the terminal there. And then we'll go ahead and take a peek at these result images. So as you see with the titles, with the result underscore in front of them, because that's what we chose to save them as, and in that same directory since we did current directory. And then one of these was the same image that we had from before. We're still not getting that person class on there. All right, so uh, zooming in on this larger image uh, as we look through our inference results here, and this is just a larger image, uh, so that's why the labels look a lot smaller here, but you'll notice how well it's working. Uh, our model is generalizable both on construction sites and non-construction site situations. So that gives us some good hope here that we can get this use case really working well. 
and also working in such a way that we're going to have more and more limited cases of false detections. At least that's that's kind of what I'm gathering here from how it's working both on and off construction sites for detecting what I wanted it to detect. Uh, but active learning, again, is really going to help us here improve this model. And so as we get this model deployed, uh, remember you can use this process with a model that was trained with RoboFold Train or a model that you also custom trained that was YOLO v5 or YOLO v8 uh, that we have available at the time of recording of this video. So if you upload those model weights to RoboFlow, you can also deploy those with this method. And some other things on performance expectations or offline capability. When it comes to the offline aspect, the first time you actually run this, um, it's downloading and caching those weights. If you don't have offline mode, as essentially you don't have a RoboFlow enterprise plan, if you do disconnect from internet, you will still be able to run inference, but the second that Pi loses connection or loses power, um, you're going to need to connect to the internet again to add those weights back to the device. Just a quick walkthrough here of the hosted infer uh, API code. So this is available to be used to kind of just run this logic, maybe not just in Python, but another language if you had an interest in doing this in another language. Um, we have the Python package too, if you wanted to dig a little bit deeper there or use more of the Python package uh, within your process. Or here, another thing you can do is uh, accelerate the inference speed on say for video. If you wanted to attach another device like uh, Luxonis Oak device and deploy with our RoboFlow Oak package or the Luxonis Depth SDK, then you could actually run, um, run predictions uh, and an accelerated rate with that Oak because it has a TPU on it, a tensor processing unit, and then connect it to your Pi to uh, control the logic. So that Pi there will be controlling the logic, but the Oak itself will be running the inferences to give you a little bit of a boost in the frames per second. So lots of options here on how you can, on how you can run this, but we have more guides for that available too. So uh, just go ahead and look in the description here of the video if you wanted to check out some of those other links uh, for for ways to accelerate inference, or if you wanted to dig through more of the documentation or code examples or models that we brought forward for you today here in this video. So that's how we deploy with Docker to a Raspberry Pi. Thank you again for watching.